<laughs> My hometown is very small and rural. It is not a very interesting place to grow up. My friends and I were always trying to come up with interesting diversions to preserve our collective sanity. We all had some degree of interest or curiosity in the paranormal, and living in the South, ghost stories are fairly common. So, we decided if there was any truth to these tales, we wanted to experience it firsthand. We began our own little paranormal investigation group, limited to our group of friends, and set out to investigate every tale we heard. We saw the glowing tombstone, a local attraction that the police tried to keep the kids away from. It did indeed glow with an eerie green phosphorus, but only when struck by moonlight. Many of the stories turned out to be based on natural phenomena or optical illusions to our great disappointment. Most of our leads were total washouts, with nothing interesting at all to see or hear. A few endangered feelings of anxiety in the group are produced impressions of other presences. Overall, most of the summer was spent on fool's errands. Then I heard about the church. The summer was over, and I was back in college when an acquaintance of mine told me about a small adventure he had at a haunted church. He was a police dispatcher in the local constabulary, a large, powerful man. He said he was with a young lady whom he desired to score, and he decided to take her to an old church that was supposed to be haunted in order to get her in the mood as it were. She felt anxious even being near the place, and he had no intention of leaving his truck himself. I should mention that in my area, at least, there's a standard story that everyone tells about any church that looks creepy. They say that the pastor, deacon, etc. was found dead there one morning, his head having been cut off, presumably during the night. The church is now haunted, possibly by the murdered man. Invariably, there is an element about a Bible, most often a large one on a pedestal right inside the door. Supposedly, one cannot pick it up, or perhaps one can pick it up, but not approach the podium with it, as it becomes increasingly heavy, or it bleeds, or it's always at the same page, whatever. And they always tell you that the church is never locked, and you can go in it at any time, though it is never the case. So. My police friend proceeded to tell me the same story about this particular church. Needless to say, I was not particularly impressed, having heard the same story about many other churches, most of which turned out to be totally innocuous. But in my pursuit of the strange and interesting, I persuaded him to take me there anyway. Another guy I knew decided to come along, and he brought his girlfriend. We all piled into my grand aunt and took off for Lewisburg. Lewisburg is a small town too. You can pass through it without noticing it very much. We took a series of back roads to get to the church. The road started out bad and continued to get progressively worse until my only thought was please don't let my car break down here. The trees on either side of the road were very thick and covered the sky almost completely above the road, creating an eerie, claustrophobic feeling. Suddenly, we went around a curve and the church was before us. There was a small gravel area on the right side of the road, in front of the church. Raw iron gates opened into a small path that led to the church, perhaps 80 feet from the gravel area. The church itself didn't look particularly old, maybe 40 years or so, and it was the size of a large barn. A graveyard surrounded the church on both sides, and continued behind the church, like a horseshoe, with a church in the middle. I decided that the little gravel area, Room enough for two cars, parallel to the road, was too conspicuous, and spotted a small pull-off across the road from the church. The area was wooded, and it looked like I could pull the car out of sight. I parked the car and began to get out. The policeman, whose name was David, immediately protested. He thought it was a really bad idea to get out. I responded that I had driven a long way, and there was no way I was going to investigate. The other guy, Art, and his girl, Crystal, spoke up and said no way they were leaving the car. I said that was fine, as I had the only flashlight and they could sit in the car in the dark. They soon followed. I went across the road, through the raw iron gates, onto the path, and thus lead to the porch of the church. I twisted the doorknob with no expectation that it would turn, but it did, 
It really was unlocked. My party began to protest. Surely I didn't intend to enter. I did. After a moment, they followed. The interior of the church was a major disappointment. There was no pedestal, no Bible. It was fairly standard as far as churches go. My party felt very uneasy, and each said at least once that the place felt wrong and somehow bad. I felt nothing. Over a period of years, I've noticed that some people seem to be more in tune with spirits or psychic vibrations or whatever they are, while some seem oblivious to them, as a blind man to light. I'm blind to them. I poked around a little, but found nothing interesting. It looked to me like it was regularly used for services. We exited the church. My party expressed great relief and indicated that we could leave at any moment. I felt like I had wasted my evening, not to mention a tank of gas. I insisted upon looking at the graveyard before we left. Begrudgingly, they agreed. The graveyard was very old. A very few of the stones were from the past 20 years or so, with mostly being early 1990s. Some of the stones were too old and worn to be read at all, basically just irregular granite nubs. A few of the graves were weird, with tiny wrought iron fences around the grave and stone, to a height of about three feet. Finally, it seemed that I had exhausted all the possibilities the place had to offer, so I agreed to leave. Everyone but me was very glad to go, and expressed great unease at being there. We waded back to the pull-off and got in the car. When I turned my headlight on, I saw that the pull-off was adjacent to another small graveyard that we had not previously noticed, walking in the darkness towards the church. I insisted we look at it before leaving. This area had much stranger graves than the other, larger ones surrounding the church. Some of the graves were nothing more than the piles of stones, and one was encircled by a small barbed wire fence. My party was huddled together in fear and begged that we leave. They said that they felt evil presences. I was prepared to agree, once again to leave, when I spotted a small path that led into the forest. I told them we could leave after checking out the path. They all said no, no, no way are we going down that path. I said that was fine with me. They could wait on me there and set off down the path. The path led to a clearing of 150 feet or so in diameter. I'm a poor judge of distance in the woods. The trees made an abrupt wall around it. It seemed odd and pretty creepy. I was walking into the clearing with my flashlight pointed straight ahead scanning the area for anything interesting. I would hear that David, Art, and Crystal were following, perhaps 75 feet behind me. Suddenly, both my eyes and my flashlight found a huge beast before me. It was the size of a very large man, on all fours. Its body was covered with silver or gray hair. It seemed to be gnawing at or smelling of something on the ground. The instant my light hit it, it raised its head and looked directly at me. I remember the impression of a snout, and pointed ears towards the top of the head. Its eyes, however, were human. By that I mean that they did not reflect the beam of my flashlight like a dog or cat, or any night animal for that matter. They looked like the eyes of a man. This beast was about 20 feet in front of me. There was a gravestone in front of it, and slightly to the left. Another was behind, and to the right of it. It looked at me for maybe a second. I was completely frozen. No thought entered my mind, no emotion. I was blank. Then the creature stood up. It looked about eight or nine feet tall and very, very big. Not fat, but it was muscular. It turned towards the forest behind us and ran into the trees. It moved so fast, I have no words to adequately describe it. It was very nimble, especially for a creature so big. My mind began to thaw out. I had seen, or at least I thought I saw, the beast for around three seconds. It is hard to say, as the entire encounter was in that slow molasses perception, usually reserved for automobile accidents, and it seemed like several minutes. My first reaction was that I had imagined, hallucinated, or otherwise conjured the image. I realized that I heard, and could still hear, the beast making its way through the forest. I could hear the leaves crackling and twigs snapping as something large made its way rapidly away from my position. David came running up beside me. I wonder if he had seen it for an instant. Then I heard what he was yelling at me as he ran up. Did you see that fucking thing? Did you see it? Jesus, it was huge. I asked him to describe what he saw. He described the creature perfectly. 
I looked out into the forest, shining my light around pointlessly. For some reason, my instinct was to pursue the creature. David physically dragged me back to the path, not bothering to try to dissuade me verbally. Art and Crystal were back at the edge of the path. Crystal was sobbing uncontrollably, and Art was on the verge of tears, panic evident in his voice. They both denied they had seen anything. We got into the car, and as I started it up, I felt fear for the first time in the evening. We tore off and aimed home. David asked Art and Crystal how they could have missed seeing the beast. Art burst into tears and screamed, how the hell could I have not seen it? David proceeded to grill them for details, their terrified description matching David's in my own memory perfectly. Later at my apartment, I related the story to my roommate. He thoughtfully puffed his cigarette for a moment, then asked me, what would you have done if the creature had run towards you? My blood felt like ice then. For some reason, it had not occurred to me how easily the powerful beast could have ripped me to shreds. Its speed was such that its prey would have little time for action before meeting its demise. A few days later, I saw a friend of mine on campus. We had lunch, and I told him my story. I did not tell him where I was, or the name of the church. He said he knew of a place that sounded similar, which was haunted. He said it was in Lewisburg, and proceeded to name the church. I was astounded. He said that people in that area knew about the church and the graveyard. He said the graveyard was very, very old, and that some Native Americans were buried there. The graveyard was there before the church or the road. Both were built on top of it. My mind raced, and I immediately realized that the small graveyard was pretty obviously a part of the larger, horseshoe-shaped one. I asked him if they had moved the graves, or just the stones. He said that he didn't know, but that there was no record of them having been moved. He said that he had been there several times himself, and that was, in his opinion, definitely haunted. Another friend was more interested in the creature itself, and said that he had once seen one himself, and that they were known to live in an area that he had described, which included the area in which the church was located. He described a logging roads that cut into a large section of virgin forest nearby. He said that teenagers used to park on the logging roads to make out, and that one of his friends had a terrifying experience there. This guy was with his girlfriend, in a pickup truck, doing the deed. The truck suddenly began to bounce up and down, the back end striking the ground. They stopped what they were doing and looked around in alarm. In the truck bed was a large brown beast that sounded much like the creature I had seen. It was jumping up and down in the bed, its arms dangling like a gorilla. They both began screaming in terror, incapable of action. The beast seemed to grow bored of the game in a minute or two and leaped out of the truck bed. It darted across the road and into the forest at amazing speed. The pair left the area post haste. I've personally visited this church on several or so occasions, and I've never failed to experience supernatural occurrences of some kind. I would like to hear from anyone who has seen or heard of any similar creatures. I recognize that this story does not fit the traditional category of haunting, but many of the other things I've seen and heard there do. This story has become overlong, and I will end it. But if anyone seems interested, I will post follow-up articles detailing my further experiences at the church. I've deliberately omitted the name or exact location of the church, as the police are already upset that I and my friends visited it. We have spoken with them several times. They realize that we mean no harm, and are not damaging any property in any way. The land is public property, and they have acknowledged that they have no actual right to prevent us from going there. I wonder if the police are aware of what's going on there. I suspect they do. Thank you for reading. This happened years ago. I really don't remember how old I was at the time, but I don't think I was more than about 9 years old. That would put this time as somewhere during the summer of 1984. My grandparents, my mom's parents, lived out in the country about 15 minutes drive from home. I was spending the weekend with my grandparents. The story that follows occurred on the Friday night of that weekend. It was after dark. I was on the couch, turned around, and sitting on my knees, looking out a large picture window. I was waiting on Grandpa to get home from work. Grandma and I were the only two people in there at the time. As I waited, a dense fog began to form. The fog began to grow thicker as time passed. Grandma was getting a bit worried. 
Grandpa was late getting home, and she was afraid he'd have an accident due to low visibility brought on by the fog. Several more minutes passed. I was still kneeling on the couch, watching outside the window for Grandpa. Then I saw what looked like two lights coming up the road towards the house. At first, I thought it was the lights from the headlights on Grandpa's car. Then I realized that the lights were not the right color. One light seemed to be a lemon yellow, while the other appeared pink. I watched, curious, as the lights moved closer. Then I yelled for Grandma to come to the window and look at them. Grandma was busy preparing supper and didn't want to leave the kitchen. I took another look at the lights, which were still moving closer, and then went to the kitchen to try to convince Grandma to come and see them. At this point, the lights were still not much more than fuzzy colored blobs due to the thick fog. I left the window and ran into the kitchen. I told Grandma that there was a pair of lights approaching the house. She said something along the lines of good, he's finally home. I told her that the lights didn't look like they were from a car. I told her about the odd coloration. Finally, Grandma agreed to go take a look for herself. Running, I got to the window before Grandma did. I resumed my former kneeling position on the couch before really looking out the window. The light was still there, closer than before. They were just starting to take on a more definitive shape, like something was emerging from the fog. Grandma leaned over for a closer look at the solidifying shapes. I turned her, asking what the lights were. She didn't know and was beginning to act a bit scared by the sight. I turned back to the window. The strange lights were almost to the house by that point. Thinking back now, I realized just how bright they must have been to have been visible at first. Then, the lights finally took on a more tangible shape. This is the part that really makes me doubt what we thought we saw. What we saw looked to be two cows, both bulls, dancing along the road on their hind legs. No, this is not a joke. One was glowing yellow, the other was glowing pink. Each of the bulls had a front leg, arm dripped over the shoulder of the other. They were heading towards the driveway. At this point, Grandma fainted. I only remember giving her a quick look as she clasped beside me on the couch. Then I resumed staring in disbelief and shock at the sight outside. The bulls danced along until they got to the driveway, turned as if to make their way up to the house. Then, they just both faded away. After some time, I'm not sure how long exactly, but I don't think it was more than a minute or so, I turned away from the window to Grandma. She was still unconscious. I had no idea how to revive her. I remember shaking her as if trying to wake a sleeping person and talking to her. I do not recall what I said. After a few moments, she began to stir. As Grandma woke up, she turned quickly back to the window. I told her that whatever we had seen was gone. I asked her what we had seen. Grandma sat me down on the couch and told me that I was not to breathe a word of what had happened to Grandpa when he got home. I asked why. Grandma wouldn't give me an answer. She just kept telling me to keep quiet about it. A few minutes later, we heard a car door slam outside. Grandpa was home. Again, Grandma warned me not to say a word to Grandpa about what just happened. Naturally, the moment Grandpa entered the house, I ran straight to him and told him everything that happened. Grandpa spared only a second to ask Grandma if she was okay. The moment she said yes, Grandpa retrieved a shotgun and went outside. Grandma began to scold me very loudly for disobeying her orders. Several minutes later, Grandpa came back in. He had found nothing. To this day, neither of them will discuss what happened that evening. If that had been the end of the matter, I would have convinced myself years and years ago that both Grandma and I had simply been hallucinating. In fact, not too long after the incident, I'd convinced myself of that. Several years after seeing the bulls at my grandparents' house, a friend of mine who I grew up with came to me one day with a story. I'll call this girl A. Both she and I were about 12 when she told me this. When I lived in Ohio, this girl's grandparents lived directly behind us. A lived mostly with her grandparents during the summer months. Only a one-lane alley separated our two yards. Across this girl's grandparents' yard was the railroad bed I've posted about a few times in the past. On the other side of the railroad bed was a small farm. We lived at the very edge of the town. A came to me one day, saying that she had something very strange the previous night happened to her. I asked her what she'd seen. A 
made a long speech about how I'd think she was crazy if she told me. I pointed out that she'd already brought up the subject, obviously. She wanted to tell me. A agreed. She said that late the night before, she had been unable to sleep and had been looking out of her bedroom window. It began to get foggy. In the fog, A claimed to have seen two glowing lights moving across the pasture back at the farm. One light was yellow, the other pink. Please keep in mind that I had not told anyone about what Grandma and I had seen at this point. A said that, as the lights got closer to the railroad bed, they began to take on solid shapes. At that point, I was starting to get cold chills. A said that she must have been seeing things and that she wouldn't waste time telling me the rest of her story. I insisted that she did. After a few minutes, A said, almost in tears, that the lights took on the shapes of cows, bulls. Each bull had a front leg draped over the shoulders of the other. Both appeared to be dancing along their hind legs. They were moving towards the railroad bed, towards A's grandparents' house. A said that at that point, she had turned away from her window and hid under the blankets until morning. After A told me her story, I told her my own, very similar one. As far as I know, A never saw the bulls again after that night. If not for A's story, I would have long since come to believe that what Grandma and I had seen was a hallucination brought on by the dense fog and car headlights or something like that. A's story makes me think again. I don't know what we saw, but I do know that we saw something. Anyone have any ideas? Thank you. I love reading your stories, so I thought I would include one of my own. I'm still not sure what happened at this house in Germany, but I'm very, definitely sure that it happened. My wife and I were married in April of 1972, and at the same time, I was reassigned to duty on Schembach Air Base in Schembach, Germany. By the winter of 1973, we had rented a beautiful house from a wonderful couple named Carl and Alfreda Jacob. This house was located in Schulstrasse, Munchweiler, Germany. This was just a few miles from Sembach Air Base and was generally located in the south of Germany, near Kaiserslautern. At the time we lived there, the house was 160 years old. I am sorry that we lost in touch with Carl and Alfreda. They were some of the nicest people I have ever known. As far as that goes, we were the only Americans living in this village and the people there were top notch and we lived a quiet existence. Our first child, a boy, was born while we lived there. His coming seemed to manifest a presence that my wife and I really were not aware of at first. There had been a few noises and such, but we really didn't think much about it. Sometimes, it would feel as though we were being watched. As our son grew though, the first few months of life, there were many concerns, and this is only one of them. As time goes by, I will relate stories that happened in the house, but the one I will tell you now concerns something without. The baby was about six or seven months old. As babies of that age sometimes do, he was crying and seemed to want to. My wife was letting him cry it out for a little while. He was in our bedroom in the crib. Our bedroom was on the back side of the house and there was a small walkway besides the house and a concrete wall. The backyard was on the side of the hill and the ground was at the top level of that wall, just about even with the bedroom window. The walkway was less than two feet wide. The house had upstairs bedrooms, but we hardly ever used them. From the backyard, one had to go down some steps beside our bedroom and then open an arched door in the eight foot high brick wall to reach the front yard. We were blessed to have grass and this was outside passage from the front to the back. The arched door was wrought iron covered with pixaglass and had an iron deadbolt door that latched it closed. Once in the front yard, there was a wrought iron fence at the street and the yard itself was about two and a half feet higher than the street and the fence was about four feet higher. Our neighbors to the right were the last house before the trail up to the woods and the backside both of our houses was open to the fields. My landlady had instructed us that it is very important that we close and lock the wooden shutters over all our windows and lock the deadbolt outside the gate every night. It was dark. 
at around 9 o'clock, when the baby was crying and we heard something in the backyard, outside our bedroom window. Whatever it was, it was making an eerie sound, mimicking the baby crying. Whatever it was, it was big. We could hear it drawing breath into its lungs and wailing with a sound that would chill you right up to your spine. Standing in the backyard, by the window, it was probably about two feet away from the shutters. I had no gun, being a foreigner in Germany. The thing that bothered me and frightened me most, we listened to it for about 10 or 15 minutes. I finally decided that I would wake up with my bowie knife and throw open the storm shutters and attack it. My yelling at it through the open window and through the wooden shutters had no effect on it. We then decided that giving it access to the house in this fashion was not a good idea. I then thought that I would go out to the front, since we had no back door, and go around the house and take it on brute. My wife didn't want me to go out, but I found out later that she just didn't want to be in the house alone. Like I said, the thing was big by its sound. Its wail was a high sound, almost a scream, and in between screams and wails, we could hear low guttural growls similar to that of a lion or a big cat. I finally exclaim that I'm going out, we need some relief. I grabbed my knife and headed out for the door. I also took a hiking staff with a metallic pointed end. It took two full turns of the giant skeleton T to get the door open. By this time, I had redirected my fear to an attack attitude and was prepared to jolt the damn thing like it was doing to us. Just as I opened the front door, I could see the thing coming out beside our house. It looked like a wolf. It was just jet black and had long, coarse looking fur. It was just over three feet high at the shoulder. It glanced at me and ran across the front yard, about 50 or 40 feet, and leapt over the wrought iron fence. As it landed on the sidewalk, it took off at a run and disappeared past my neighbor's house and up the track to the woods. I walked around the house and into the backyard. The wrought iron door stood agape. To this day, I have yet to figure out how the thing opened the wrought iron door deadbolt. This story happened to my grandpa's sister. My grandpa lived in a village along with his siblings and parents. When he was young, his sister was 21 years at the time. It was a winter evening. She was returning from a neighbor's home. The distance between the two houses was almost a kilometer. As it was winter, the road was covered with mist and wind and it was very chilly. My grand aunt was carrying a torch in her hand because of the darkness. She was moving quickly. Suddenly, her torch focused on something standing in the middle of the road. It was a dark shadow-like creature. The scary thing was, even when the torch focused on the thing, it was still pitch black. None of its features were very clear, only the eyes were visible. They were glowing red. She got startled and moved back. The creature moved towards her. As it was coming closer, it was constantly changing shape. The only thing common was its black texture. My grand aunt started screaming for help. She ran backwards and towards the neighbor's home. When she reached their home, it vanished within the mist. The neighbors were surprised to see her panting like that. They asked her to come in. She was reluctant to go in that night. There were no telephones at the time, so they sent their son to inform my great-grandpa about her. My great-grandpa came to take her with him. She didn't speak a single word until morning. In the morning, she recited her incident to the whole family. My grandpa's grandmother explained that it was a chalawa, or a shapeshifter. It is a kind of notorious spirit that scares people by changing its shape or size. It looks for people who are alone in desolate areas. My granddaughter was alone, so she fell prey to it. She was lucky to get away from it though. My grandpa said that the incident haunted his sister so much that she didn't go out of the house for a week. She is 73 years old, but still avoids staying home alone. Hey, hey, it's Phantom here, and if I say hey, hey, I can be a fan fan or a phantom, whatever phantom you want me to be. Anyway guys, I just wanted to say thanks so much for helping me out on watching this video. Go ahead, comment, like, share, and subscribe. 
I'm sitting with my royal blue Phantom of Darkness merch right now. I have a picture of it on Facebook and, well, not really Facebook, but Instagram and other places like Twitter. No, but seriously, guys, I'm totally buying my merchandise and I love it so much. And I'm not just saying it. I, I mean, I'm excited for it. I don't know why. I, I like blue. Um, you know, you can get the standard black if you wanted to. And, you know, as always, you know, merch will be available in the description below. But maybe I'll post a picture in the outro. I, I don't know. Anyway, guys, good night. Good morning. I love you guys, and I'll see you in the next video if I can't understand myself enough. Just kidding. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. So I guess I'll see you in the next video anyway. Okay, bye.